What's going on guys? I'm Mr. Racine and this is part two of our videos on the production possibilities curve. Last video we introduced this diagram, which represented the production possibilities curve for my hypothetical island. If you're currently taking an economics class or are studying economics on your own, you may have seen a slightly different shaped production possibilities curve, one that looks more like this. We call this shape outward bowed or concave from the origin. Whether the PPC takes on this shape or this one is going to depend upon our assumptions about opportunity cost and the production possibilities curve, which is our topic for today's videos. Welcome to another episode of Economics Videos That Don't Suck. Legal disclaimer. Opportunity cost, which we've discussed in an earlier video in this series, is defined as the value of the next best foregone option that one sacrifices when making a choice. For example, today I had pizza for lunch. If I didn't have pizza for lunch, I would have chosen to have a ham sandwich. The opportunity cost of my choice of eating that pizza is the value of the benefit that that ham sandwich would have brought me. The opportunity cost of you watching this video right now is, well, if you weren't sitting here for these 10 minutes and watching this video, what would you be doing with your time? The value of that next best option that you gave up to watch this video is the opportunity cost of you using this time. But what does opportunity cost mean in the context of the production possibilities curve? In the case of the PPC, we're going to define opportunity cost as the quantity of good A that must be sacrificed in order to produce more of good B. Let's go back to our PPC to take a closer look. If we're producing inside the production possibilities frontier, say, two fish and two coconuts, then the idea of opportunity cost isn't really relevant. We know that if I'm producing two fish and two coconuts, well, I could get two more fish without having to give up any coconuts, or I could get four more coconuts without having to give up any more fish, so I don't really have to give up any of either. It's when we're producing on the production possibilities frontier and all of our resources are being used to their maximum potential that opportunity cost then becomes interesting. For example, let's say yesterday I collected 10 coconuts and zero fish. The next day I decide that I want to eat some fish, so I need to allocate some of the time that I was using to collecting coconuts to the production of fish, because I'm already using up all of the hours that are available on the production of coconuts. Now at the end of the second day, I've produced one fish and eight coconuts. What is the opportunity cost of catching that one fish? Again, Opportunity cost is the value of the option that is foregone when you make a choice. Here, I'm choosing to take the hour that I was using for producing coconuts and now use it for the production of fish. If I wasn't using that hour to catch fish, what would I be doing with it? I would be collecting coconuts. And how many coconuts could I have collected in that hour? Two. So the opportunity cost of catching one more fish, in this case, is two coconuts. By catching one more fish, I am giving up the ability to produce two more coconuts. The same is true if I move from this point to this point. Again, I catch a second fish, plus one fish, and I lose two more coconuts, two minus two coconuts. The opportunity cost of the second fish is two coconuts. The same is true for the third fish, and the fourth fish, and the fifth. We can also calculate opportunity cost of coconuts in terms of fish. Let's say I started up here with five fish and zero coconuts, and now I move from this point to this point. What have I gained? Well, I've gained two coconuts, and what have I lost? I've lost one fish. We like to think of opportunity cost in terms of individual units, so we can think about what is the opportunity cost of one more coconut when I go from this point to this point. Well, each additional coconut that I produce, I'm giving up half of a fish and we can see all the way down this production possibilities curve is going to be the two. Plus one coconut, minus half a fish. Plus one coconut, minus half a fish. So this is the idea of opportunity cost. If an economy is already produced at maximum potential and it wants to increase the production of one good, how much of the other good does it have to sacrifice? If you're mathematically inclined, you might see that opportunity cost is gonna be directly related to the slope of the production possibilities curve. 
You see that in this diagram, the opportunity cost of fish and coconuts is the same at all points on the PPC. If an economy were to have a straight line, constant slope PPC like this, it would suggest that all of the factors of production are perfectly substitutable. This means that all factors of production are the exact same and equally proficient at producing the goods. Okay, so this might seem like a bit of a strange assumption, uh, but let's take a look at an economy where factors of production are the exact same uh, just to illustrate this idea. Let's say that we have an economy that produces only two goods, steel and movies. And let's say that this economy has 15 units of labor and three units of capital. So in this example, all of the labor is identical. All of these guys have the exact same skills, the exact same capabilities. And the capital, I guess, is identical as well. So if we're making steel and movies, then we have to have a unit of capital that can make both steel and movies. So this is a steel making movie camera. Okay, so let's say we can divide our labor and capital up into work units for simplicity. So one work unit will consist of five units of labor and one unit of capital. Okay, so let's assume that each one of these work units is capable of producing either movies or steel. Okay, so if the work unit were producing movies, let's assume that in one year they were capable of producing two movies. Okay, we could also assign this work unit to produce steel, and in one year they could produce, let's assume, two tons of steel. Okay, so we can then analyze uh, the different combinations of movies and steel our economy could produce uh, given the assumptions that we've set up about the nature of our factors of production. So if we put all of our factors of production, all 15 units of labor and three units of capital into the production of steel, we'll wind up with six tons of steel. We can plot that here on our production possibilities curve. This is probably a pretty boring economy. Maybe we'd like some entertainment. We could assign one of our work units to the production of movies rather than the production of steel. In this case, we could produce two movies and four tons of steel, which we can plot right here. Other combinations could yield four movies and two tons of steel here. Or if we had all of our labor and all of our capital producing movies, then we would be able to produce six movies and zero tons of steel. And again, we have this straight line production possibilities curve. If we go from producing six movies to four movies, we gain two tons of steel, but we give up two movies in order to produce that additional steel. The opportunity cost of one more ton of steel is one fewer movie. In order to produce more one more ton of steel, we need to give up one movie. Going from two tons of steel to four tons of steel is the same. We gain two tons of steel, but we give up two movies. The opportunity cost of each additional ton of steel is one movie. Again, going from four tons of steel to six tons of steel, we gain two tons of steel, we give up two movies. Going back the other way, the same is true. Each additional movie that you produce means we're giving up one more ton of steel. With a straight line production possibilities curve like this, opportunity cost is constant. Each additional movie I produce means I'm giving up one ton of steel. Each additional ton of steel you produce means you're giving up one movie. And this stems from the fact that all of the factors of production are identical. All of these workers are the exact same. Each set of five workers and one unit of capital is capable of producing either two movies or two units of steel in one year. That is a stupid assumption. It's not the same labor. It's not the same capital. That's definitely not how the real world works. That doesn't make any sense. Why, 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 why? Economics is stupid. I give up, I give up. I'm not gonna study. Okay, okay, I, I, I agree with you, right? Uh, not all factors of production are the same. Let's try and build some more realistic assumptions into this model and, and see how that affects the shape of the production possibilities curve. <laughs> Okay, so in this case, we still have 15 units of labor and three units of capital, but now they're not all the same. Let's say that five units of labor and one unit of capital are better at producing movies. These guys. 
In one year, they could produce, let's say, three movies. Okay, they're also capable of producing steel somehow. Like, they could produce steel. They're not very good at it. So they could produce one ton of steel in a year. Okay, the second group, let's say they're kind of the average Joes again, and they're capable of producing two tons of steel in a year, or two movies. They're kind of equally capable. They're not really better at either one. And then finally, we have uh, five units of labor and one unit of capital that are really, really good at the production of steel, right? So in one year, they could produce three tons of steel, and they also could produce movies, um, and it probably wouldn't be very good. So let's say they could produce one movie in a year. Okay, so again, we still have 15 units of labor and three units of capital, but now they're not all identical. Okay, let's assume that all of our factors of production are producing steel. In this case, we would get three tons of steel from these guys, two tons of steel from these guys, and one ton of steel from these guys for a total of six tons of steel. Now, in the following year, again, it's probably quite boring to produce only steel, so they decide that they want to shift some of their factors of production into the production of movies. So the question is, which work unit should be shifted into the production of movies first? Clearly these guys, right? It makes sense to shift the factors of production into the production of movies that are actually good at the production of movies. If this were the case, then we would have these guys making movies and these guys still making steel, and we would be producing five tons of steel produced by these two work units and three movies produced by this work unit. We could then plot that point here on the production possibilities curve. If they want to produce even more movies, it seems like it would make sense for this to be the next work unit that were shifted over to the production of movies because they're just better than these guys at it. If we had two units working on movies and one work unit working on steel, we would then have three tons of steel and five movies. Or finally, we could have all of our factors of production producing movies, in which case we would have six movies produced in one year. Now, we have this production possibilities curve that takes this familiar shape, this concave shape, this outward bowed production possibilities curve. And why is this one different from the previous one? Why is it not a straight line? It's because of increasing opportunity cost as we produce more movies or steel that comes from the fact that now factors of production are differentiated or specialized. So we can look at it. Moving from this point to this one, we gain three movies and give up one ton of steel. So the opportunity cost of each one of those three movies, the amount of steel that we give up to produce one more movie is one third of a ton of steel over this range on the production possibilities curve. Going from this point to this point, we gain two movies and sacrifice two tons of steel. Here, the opportunity cost of each one of those additional movies is one ton of steel. The opportunity cost has increased from one-third of a ton of steel to one ton of a steel. And finally, moving from this point to this point, we gain one movie and we give up three tons of steel. The opportunity cost of one movie over this range of the production possibilities curve is three tons of steel. Opportunity cost is increasing as we produce more movies. The greater the quantity of movies we produce, the larger the amount of steel we need to sacrifice for each additional movie. It works the same going the other way as well. Going from this point to this point, we gain three tons of steel and only give up one movie. The opportunity cost of one ton of steel is only one third of a movie. As we produce more steel, the opportunity cost of one more ton of steel becomes one movie. And finally, down here, when we gain one ton of steel and give up three movies, the opportunity cost of each additional ton of steel is three movies. Again, opportunity cost is increasing as we move along the production possibilities frontier. And why is it increasing? Because the factors of production are now different. Some factors of production are good at producing steel. Some factors of production are good at producing movies. At first, when we increase production of a good, factors of production are shifted over that are better at producing that good. But as factors of production become more scarce, as we increase the production of a particular good, the opportunity cost of the production of that good increases as well.
Okay, so this has been the production possibilities curve. And the most important idea from today is the concept of opportunity cost as it relates to the production possibilities curve. One, in the context of the production possibilities curve, opportunity cost looks at how much of a good do you have to give up in order to gain one more unit of another good. If we produce one more movie, how many fewer tons of steel are we going to be producing? Two, the shape of the production possibilities curve will depend upon the assumptions we make about the factors of production and opportunity cost. Three, a straight line production possibilities curve suggests that factors of production are identical, and as a result, the opportunity cost of producing one more of a good is constant, regardless of the quantity of that good that is produced. Four, an outward bowed or concave production possibilities curve suggests increasing opportunity cost. The more that you produce of a good, the greater the quantity that you're going to be giving up of the other good. This arises when factors of production are not identical, and in fact, some are better suited at the production of one good, and some are better suited at the production of the other. Hey, what's going on? I hope you liked this video and it helped clarify some of the stuff you're working on in your current economic studies. If you're looking for more resources to help you with AP economics, IB economics, intro level university economics, economics teaching resources, one, go check out our website, economics videos that don't suck, evtds.com, for access to our entire catalog of economics videos, as well as practice questions, answers, and even entire mock exams. Two, be sure to subscribe to this channel, economics videos that don't suck, so you can get immediate access to all of our new videos as they're released, probably mirroring your economic studies right now.